Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Filmhouse. Once again, I'm joined by James and Elise. How are you guys doing? Hey. Good. And Good special guest, Neil Blomkamp. How you doing? Good. Hey. Thanks for having me. That's good. I just called a random number on Skype and you showed up. So. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. You're the official director of Filmhouse. Like yeah. the the only like real actual like successful <laughs> industry friend we have. <laughs> I can't just say friend too. It's <laughs> all thanks to the amazing Stephen Blomkamp. Yeah. Uh, well, last we talked, uh, you had just launched Oats. How has that journey been for you uh, this year? Good. I love this company. I mean, um, I think it's. I think it's been really good. Mm -hmm. yeah. From the uh, the series of films that you put out, um, you had you put out a few more. Like some some of the episodes, like Firebase, you only had one. But then uh, like the Adam series, uh, I noticed that you put out, I believe, three. Right. Yeah. Um, well, actually. Um, God, you know, which is actually one of my favorites. We shot four episodes of God, mm -hmm. and uh, we have finished post production on two of them, and then we uploaded one of them. Oh, so okay. uh, so that you know that one is that one is weird because the, we shot so many episodes of it. It was the same with Capture as well. We only uploaded one Capture, whether there are actually quite a few other ones. Mm -hmm. um, but something really weird happened with with God in the sense that uh, obviously the pieces are very satirical and quite cutting, um, and the the piece that we didn't upload featured a building that was burning that we shot about a year before the Grenfell Tower in London, and it just seemed incredibly like, not uh, you know just tasteless yeah. and horrific, so we just didn't release it. Do you, do it's you, kind of a strange strange place to be. To do be you feel in the middle? Do of. you feel that pressure uh, working sort of in this online space where? Your your choice to put something out there is affected by real world events. Is that a constant struggle? Well, that that one was particularly weird. I mean, uh, I, I think I think one of the goals of Oats is almost to do that the other way around, where if we can put out stuff quickly enough and respond to culture, you know, that's a really cool place to be, where you can watch something on the news and then you can respond to it. Um, being, being caught out the other way around where you shoot something one or two years ahead of like a really tragic event is not where you want to be. Well, mm -hmm. I know like in the situation of the president's motorcade, like test yeah. footage you guys did, it's yeah. like, oh, well, politics right now are in <laughs> even, you know, more ridiculous than that. So it's like, yeah. how do you? Yeah, well, you that, that's exactly what happened to that entire series. We shot a full series called Bad President. Oh. And um you know, we, we have, I think we must have close to an hour of, of final edited, completed stuff. And it's just, I just felt like, you know, we shot it a year before Trump was around and it's like everything that that show was meant to be about will be compared against him. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, well that, that's just, we should just shelve that for a few years. I feel like that's like how shows yeah. like Veep and House of Cards probably feel too, where they're like, we're making these completely corrupt elected officials, but what we have going on is like so much right. worse. <laughs> So yeah, I mean the show. The show, you know, the the genesis for it was kind of this 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 frat boy. Essentially, it was kind of like this out of control person that just should never ever be in the position that he's in, and um, and it was very it was very sort of frat boy sort of slanted in the way that everything about the character was was set up, and and then all of a sudden uh, Trump was in the running and then he was elected and now you cannot release something like this I think without being it you know compared to the the real situation so it just it just made us sort of shelve it yeah I also think especially like as the creator of something like that it, it's one thing to have an intention by making something and it's another thing for it to be coincidental because then yeah. you know the intention you can yeah, take exactly. responsibility for but yeah. the coincidence this is, is, this is a complete it's literally an entire co you know coincidence it's very yeah. very strange and we we had we had uh, sort of done it a year out before he was elected. I mean, it's just yeah, it's a strange set of circumstances. I so. I have a crazy pitch for you. You can take it. It's free. Okay. Uh, Five hundred years in the future, man has colonized all the universe. Mm -hmm. uh, we have discovered a new alien race. Should we outlaw laser guns in schools? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just think stupid. Yeah, it may work. It, you know. Or it, clear it, clear space should. backpacks might <laughs> also be the yeah. <laughs> way right. to do it. I don't know. Right. It's been stupid. Well, uh, that, I, yeah. I was just going to say, that's really interesting to me how far, how much, if you had to guess, maybe you know exactly, but if you had to guess how much content has Oats produced since you guys started getting this running? Like, Do you know to the minute? <laughs> uh, to the minute, I think um, I think it's a, almost exactly two hundred minutes. I think. Oh. Okay. 
Okay, of, yeah, I think. I think we've released, I don't know, maybe 120 minutes, I would mm-hmm. say. Okay. Somewhere in that in that zone, yeah. And that was never a goal. You never sat down and said, I want to release 200 minutes of stuff. You just, the, uh, remind me again, but the initial goal was you just wanted to make cool things and kind of saw, and kind of see what stuck, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, the the one one sort of measurement yardstick that you can use is a dollar per minute ratio. So um, you, you, you obviously you have to know how many dollars you have to make the stuff that you want to make. And then if you kind of roughly stick to your dollar per minute ratio, it means that you know roughly how many minutes you'll make. So we sort of roughly stick to that. Yeah, because for like our viewers that, that aren't familiar with Oats, it's a short film, st- or would you consider it a short film studio? For Still? now, yeah. Yeah, for now. Yeah. And uh, yeah. you're kind of working outside the traditional studio system. So you're yeah. completely independently financed or you were, like, yeah. were yeah. And, yeah. and now you're looking to start a Kickstarter. Yeah, yeah, I think, um, I mean, the summary, if, if I try to explain what it is, there's there's me inside of Hollywood and, and traditional filmmaking, which is still obviously very appealing and, and very much still part of my life. So if you put that over to the side and it's just, you know, over there, then I think of this project entirely separately and entirely differently. It's it's a case of um, th- there's there's a there's a sort of there's a thing that happens in filmmaking where you build up a team and then you make the film and then you 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 get to know everyone and then you sort of destroy it and and it, everyone is is fractured and shot apart and they go back to freelance work and they work on other films and some other team is created and one part of this equation was like what if all of the people that we all like working together with kind of stay together under one roof. And um, it, I almost started thinking of it almost like Pixar in a way. Pixar is the only real kind of closest thing that I can think of. But it's like, what if you were to do that in live action and, um, and, and, and kind of your core team is no longer nomadic. It kind of is like under one roof. And that starts to feel a lot more like a game company, you know, because that's sort of like how games are produced. So then, then that got me to thinking like, well, if game companies operate in this little miniature ecosystem, this biosphere that they're inside of, and then they make content and they sell it directly to people that are their fans or their users, and they have a one-on-one relationship with them, like why couldn't something filmic or you know, two-dimensionally narrative-based linear content work that way? And so that, that was the original genesis. And then it kind of turned into like, you could work totally outside of the system and sell things the way that games work, which is what led me to Steam. Um, where if if we build up enough of a fan base, we could sell directly to them if they like it and be funded to do more stuff that we sell back to them and then just start growing. And that is that is exactly what the goal is. So if I if I look five years or ten years down the line, if if we somehow magically get this to work. It should be that we have enough incoming dollars that we could do stuff easily at the scale of District 9, mm-hmm. right? Where it's like, here's a two hour film. Um, but it's, you have this absolutely separate one on one relationship with the audience. And you can also sort of do whatever you want. And uh, they'll let you know if they like it or not. Does that so, mean, though, yeah. for you, zero downtime? Because it sounds like that's. Well, that, I don't is that, really is have that like to, two movies a year? Is that like, it, is that, like Pixar's always working on like two or three movies at a time is that that's it's, what it's you just want? it's just a dollars it's just a dollars thing for us right like i don't the, the idea of downtime doesn't really apply to me i don't i don't even really know what that is but <laughs> i mean that's me personally mm-hmm. yeah. but in terms of the company you have to have enough dollars coming in that the system is operational so um in a perfect world you would have pre-production production and post-production always happening Mm-hmm. And that would always just be turning and you'd always be handing off new new ideas and new experiments. Well, kind of going off the Pixar model, um, you're you're known as a writer director, but could you see yourself just sitting back as a producer on on someone else's like someone else that works for you or works within your your ecosystem taking over the helm or, you know, yeah. kind of like you're saying, it, Pixar does do. Well, at least a movie a year, sometimes two, but it's not always the same director. Yeah. They're cycling through. Totally. But the, 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 the issue, and this is what we've run into like when we started releasing content, is, is we, got, we got inundated with people sending us scripts and ideas, right? Which is exactly what I do not want right now. So it's like we need several years to get up on our feet before we can even entertain taking in something from someone else. I think mm. the message I tried to get across, and some people understood this and some people didn't, is... Um, instead of 
instead of like grabbing onto a piece of IP the way that studios do and like, you know, wrap your, your arms around, around Batman and just like, it's ours. I wanted to have anything that we made be expanded and opened up to the audience in a way that they could do whatever they wanted with it. That's what I was trying to get across. Like if you have an idea for Raka the game, tell us. Mm-hmm. And like, you're free to go make it. Just give us a percentage of if it makes cash. If it doesn't make cash, just make it anyway. Make it for free, that's fine. And because do you still have your assets available in the Steam store yeah. and the Steam workshops? No. Yeah, I think that was the misunderstanding where what I'm not saying is send us your scripts and we'll fund them for you. That's a traditional studio. We right. do, we want none of we want zero of that. But when we're up on our feet and something really interesting comes in the door, that may be possible, you know. Um what we've definitely started talking about internally is is other people's ideas in, in the company being turned into uh into pieces that we make and put out. So that could be very Pixar from within. Would there would you ever Look at uh, something like an example where a studio approached you guys, similar to how, say, Disney mm-hmm. approached like Bad Robot, and they're like, make a star, you know, use J.J. Abrams' company to make a Star Wars film, something mm. like. I don't. I doubt it. <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't. You think guys so. would never. You would never even entertain that idea. Probably not. Okay. Probably do not. You, because what that means is that we're just a vendor that's working for someone else. Then. Okay. Do you? Do I, you, I want us to be working for people that like the stuff that we make, which is, in other words, working for ourselves. And um, and th- and that's why, like, if you you know, it's like drawing an, a very distinct division, and it's like a line in the sand where you either have people giving you money to work on something, or you don't. It's entirely homegrown, and and I love the idea of having like the struggle that we're up against, where you're the small, weird, independent thing. It's like being a game startup, and you're trying to figure out how to line up all the pieces, and you're doing it like in your garage and trying to make it work. Because there's, you know, a hundred million dollar film over to the side that you can do, it doesn't necessarily help this. It's like, yeah, you can go do that and work in Hollywood. And I it's awesome. I'll go continue to do that. But it's a different thing to this. And this is like slowly just getting the engine running and figuring it out. Does that mentality apply to distribution too? Like for example, if Netflix or Hulu or Amazon came to you and said, Neil, we really want you to do an original Oats series for uh, our platform and we'll fund mm-hmm. it. But mm-hmm. you know, we have distribution rights. You've been distributing on YouTube online now. Would that be something that you guys would be game for? I have no connections. <laughs> I, I, I have nothing to offer you. I mean, I, I'm a big, I'm a huge fan of Netflix. I, I went down and, and, and met them not that long ago. Like, but I think for Oats, I would probably say no. I, I think there's just something incredibly unique about trying to do it all yourself and be and, and not not answering to anyone. You know, and it's like, so Netflix for Neil and Neil doing something, that's, that certainly is possible. But for Oats, I'd rather just, I'd rather it just be um, funded directly by the internet, doing whatever we want and hopefully people like it. It's just such a different mindset. Would you liken this again, going back to the Pixar model of a situation like, was it Brad Bird? Brad Bird did, this is a bad example. Brad Bird did Tomorrowland. But but he did, yeah, Yeah. and then, and then uh, who did John Carter? Like there were these like stellar blockbuster, stellar was like that Brad Bird. Yeah, it, it was. Yeah. I, mean, I it was a Pixar John director. A Pix- it, was a, yeah. it was these Pixar directors again going right. back and bad examples for both of these movies because they didn't exactly knock it out of the park in the box office. But like they, oh, they could always go back to Pixar, right? And right. and continue working on those types of films with those people that they know. But then they also allowed themselves as creators to step into a different business mindset and then make a different kind of movie in that? Like, is that kind mm-hmm. of what you're describing for yourself? You know, the best way to think of it is just whether you're working for someone else or not. That, yeah. that is literally the best way to think of it. Because the second that a dollar comes in the door from a corporation, the way everything about the philosophy of what you're working on changes. And that's the best way to think of it. So it's not really about the type of creativity or the type of film or which company you're working for. It's if, if someone hands you a dollar, they want $1.25 or $2 or $3 or $10 for that $1. That's not the same as, hey, internet community, if you like any of the weird stuff that we're doing, like the river god walking around in 1971 in Vietnam and you want more of it and it doesn't have to work in a way that it makes dollars, it makes profit. It's just funded by you. That that way that you approach that is entirely different. And so I think that I think the best way to think of it is is how it's funded. I, I had a quick question about the whole Kickstarter model. Do you have 
Is there is there any fear that you might be working for a, an audience that might be asking too much of you, or are you just asking them to be complacent with whatever you make? Um, yeah. Just 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 to just to kind of give you where I'm coming from. Right. We we operate off of the way we are on an internet base. We operate off of revenue, ad revenue, and stuff because we do we do have a sort of Kickstarter option for our website, but we we pretty much tell the audience what we make is what we're going to make. And we we don't ever really want to go a Patreon route because we're afraid that the audience might want to dictate what we do because the minute you do something they don't like, they just take mm. their dollar away. Yeah. Um, is yeah. that is that a fear that you have? Yeah, for sure. And um, you know, I think I think that we'll probably end up raising less money because of how explicitly honest and upfront I am about the fact that. Um, it's not actually Kickstarter. It's it's simply a link on our website, and the reason is because there is um, this philosophy of perks and merchandise and things and rewards and like all of these distractions other than what you're trying to make. I have absolutely no interest in. So it's an it's an appeal to the audience to be like, if you like Firebase, and by extension of that, if you like the rest of the oat stuff that we're making, give us money to make more Firebase. So your dollars should go through oats onto the screen, and then you should watch them. It shouldn't be that 60% of the dollars go onto the screen and 40% go into like me sending you a hat. <laughs> so, um, and that, that I'm, I'm a 150% upfront about that. It's like, it's, there, there is none of that. Fuel us to make content back for you. So how does your crowdfunding work? Is it like a Kickstarter where people are funding a project in advance, or is it more like a Patreon where on a monthly basis, they're giving you, or is, are there multiple options? So this this version um, that I want to experiment with at the moment is simply straight up to make a sequel to Firebase. So this is um, this is like, it, you know, hopefully we raise enough money that we can at least make a sequel of the same length. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna tailor the film that we make to the amount of dollars that we raise. So if we get twenty dollars, we'll shoot a cat video, and then if we get like twenty million, we'll shoot a feature film. Okay. And um, that's that's this approach right now. So on our site, with the link that you guys um, put up for us, thank you, which is the URL to to our funding page, it's through Oats. It's just Shopify through Oats, and um, those dollars will go directly into a sequel to Firebase. Um, and and then I, I you know everybody who's who's been a backer of that will obviously get that film the second it's completed. But what I may experiment also with that film, depending on its duration, is 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 selling that film to other people that didn't back it and just see. Okay. I, this is almost an experiment in like where the numbers are. Yeah. Um, I don't know. If and you're... oh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. No, sorry. go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say that um, they're they're. Uh, you know, I, I, I feel like we're probably going to be supplementing anything that comes in because I, I assume we won't raise enough. Um, and even if we sell the film back, um, I assume we also wouldn't necessarily get that much back from it. But I think over time, just continuously working on it, I think there's a point that you start to break even. And, 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 then, um, and then eventually when you start earning more money, the size and the scale of the films can start to increase. So uh, it's like a long-term thing. Hey guys, taking a quick break to remind you that this episode of Filmhouse is brought to you by Mac Weldon, quite easily one of our favorite sponsors, just because, yeah, honestly, I wear it every day. James wears it every day. I don't want to know what Bruce is wearing, but I'm sure if he had the choice, he would wear them every day. It's our favorite clothing parts that we just, it hugs our bodies. It's, it's just right there. You, why wouldn't you want something that just hugs you in such a way? Let's get to these talking points. I do want to let you know that Mack Weldon believes in smart design and premium fabrics, and that is oh so true uh, since we have lived it and we have experienced it. I, I get it. We're doing a fun ad read and you always want us to be true to you guys. Being true, I'm, I'm standing in a room right now by myself, James is probably in here, but I'm here. I'm wearing the underwear now as we speak. Mac Weldon would like you to know that it is the most comfortable underwear, sock shirts, under shirts, hoodies, and sweatpants that you will ever wear, which is true. I own some of those sweatpants and I've had some of the shirts. Actually, I have a polo, it's pretty nice. I will only wear that when I go uh, drinking you know, wine in the countryside, but those are for <laughs> special weekends. Uh, we want you guys to be comfortable. Mac Weldon wants you to be comfortable. So if you don't like your first pair, go ahead, keep them. That's fine. And you will get a refund, no questions asked. So anyway, go to MacWeldon.com and get 20% off using promo code FILMHOUSE. That's F-I-L-M-H-A-U-S. Let them know that we sent you here. Buy some of those nice under underwears. Put them on your, on your buttocks. Feel good. Stretch it out. Try to get as low to the floor as you can. 
We'll we'll see. Send me photos, but don't you know, for reasons. Back to the show. Are you, are you at all familiar with the documentary that just came out called uh, Muppet Muppet Guys Talking? No, <laughs> it's no Frank Frank Oz like fam- fam- Frank Oz famous Muppeteer Jim yeah. Henson collaborator now a director. Um, he gathered together like a group of older Muppet crew, um, okay. like writers and performers. And then just did a documentary of like them sharing old stories and they sold it by the model of like um you can purchase just like this documentary for ten dollars or you can get like a vip edition for you know a hundred dollars which is like a signed copy of it you can go online to participate in a q a um so that was really much like the fans because they i think they were just tracking uh interest over the last year too like while they were like leading up to it they were like tracking the fans to say like how much do you really want like how much would you be willing to pay for this what's the interest there um and i i did pay pay for it (laughs) okay you do you really do like like muppets and stuff i I do (laughs) i remember that with chuck um that does sound very interesting. I mean, that yeah, that would be along the same lines, you know. Yeah, that, I mean, you don't have to that say out. anything. This to is that. this is <laughs> I just, this yeah. isn't, I just want you to know about it. This isn't necessarily <laughs> this isn't necessarily for you. This is more of a rant for the audience watching. That's not okay. even really a rant, but hit it's, it. It's I'm just saying. I think there's it's a we're in a weird situation where you can go on to Twitch and you can yeah. watch a guy who's in his basement, right? Yeah playing a video game for eight hours Steven. and you'll see you'll see people dumping money on this mm. person just he doesn't give them nearly anything back he, he may I shout out that. their name but like <laughs> yeah. he doesn't give them anything back they just dump money on him right and then and then i think when you compare that same audience to someone like i guess maybe like you or someone who has a company someone who has a career um and the world of film being different. Like, I think people think there's a certain aspect of money is already, you already have money. That's why you get to make these movies. There's a skill to it as opposed to just playing a game which is skillful, but doesn't necessarily have this production. It doesn't seem like money is being spent, but then you compare the fact and that guy in the basement makes half a million dollars a month from Mm -hmm. those people dumping money on him because he's just a regular guy playing games. Mm -hmm. Whereas a company like this or like you're trying to raise money for saying where it's like, where it's like, you don't need the help. Yeah. I just, is there, is there anything that like from your perspective, you could say to emphasize that it isn't always that way. Like Like, do you get backlash? Just because, just because your film looks expensive because it looks like it's well-made because multiple people are working on it doesn't necessarily mean that everyone involved is rich and doesn't need the help to make that kind mm. of create creativity come. yeah i mean that's that's a really interesting way to phrase it you know i think um uh, from from the audience's perspective when you when you start looking at at high budget hollywood stuff there certainly appears to be this this uh this perspective where obviously they have money and there's just money fl- flowing around and and on big films that is very much true that's very much the case um the cool, the thing that I love about about Oats is, um, you know, c- clearly, like I'm spending a lot of the cash that I've made on big on on Hollywood films to be filtered into something that's just like a creative experiment. Um, but but what I will say is, when we're working on it inside of the company, we have to do. I mean, it really is like as as close to a giant high school production, I suppose, as you could imagine, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So like having to, you know, every single thing that we're doing is like every dollar is stretched as far as it'll go because there is no corporate giant overlord watching over us and helping us with with anything financial. It's simply from us. So if there's a deal that we can cut or some way that we can like not have to spend money on something, um, a lot of people that are just passionate about doing the artwork that they're doing in whichever role that they're in, uh, you know, is is very good for us as long as those people don't feel exploited. So, yeah, in the case in in the Twitch analogy, we are essentially the guy in the basement, um, you know, playing Fortnite or whatever it may be, but making film. Mm-hmm. It's the film version mm-hmm. of that. Yeah, and, there, and, that, and that's what I'm trying to make the the clear distinction between is like. You know, obviously, creatively for us, it's amazing because we just get to do whatever we want. Like, I have some insane ideas I want to put into like the next Firebase, that um, 
maybe could be made in Hollywood and maybe not. I don't, I don't really know. Mm -hmm. um, but what I don't want to do is go through the discussion process of like why it should be made and like these, these long, you know, long drawn out meetings that are about whether fans are going to like it or not because they're going to, we're going to spend so much money that by the time it's on screens, is it going to be something that all audiences like? Do we have to water something down? I just, I understand that. And I know that has to happen when you're spending a hundred million dollars, but for what we want to do, it's just pure unbridled creativity. Mm -hmm. So that means um, in order to be able to do it, you, you, there's no other option but to risk money or ask for money from the audience that may watch it directly one-on-one. -on -one. And so, yeah, the Twitch analogy is a good one. Do you think that, or is it fair for an audience, uh, like a Kickstarter audience, to request or even demand more transparency from a studio like Oats to maybe see things that you normally don't see in the Hollywood uh, mm. system? I don't know if it's fair. Um, I think, I mean, I always come back to the same mantra, which is like dollars on screen and we're just gonna make whatever we want. You can take it or leave it. Like we're gonna operate a loss either way. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you know, it's like, give us the money so we can give you content that you like. Mm -hmm which is obviously appealing to people that only like the stuff that we've made. Uh, so it's, it's a clear thing, which is like there, there is no merchandise, there's no hats, there's no, there's no t-shirts, we're just making content. And that opens up the discussion like, well, how, you know, how much do you wanna see? Like what level of transparency is there? And I would prefer it to just be like, I sent my dollars to Oats, I got back an awesome film. Um, but I mean, I guess we can look at that, you know, maybe there's mm -hmm. a way for, I, I, I would love fans to feel like they are, we're just one big family that, you know, they're helping us make stuff that is given back to them. So I don't want them to feel like there isn't transparency, right. but I also am making the company so that we can just be autonomous. Yeah. I was just thinking from like a perspective of what you normally don't see from say uh, an MCU film is a uh, 3D modeler going from beginning to end how they created a scene that oh you mean like behind the scenes like like, like I, I imagine the from scenes. a Kickstarter perspective I think it's even more than behind the scenes because even behind the scenes is edited down to yeah. just what the studio wants you to see yeah um, sometimes you see even a bit more with like the making of the Hobbit where you're like oh those poor poor people but could there yeah is I, that something you, would, you mean is that something you would entertain where you're like yeah. We're going to go on Twitch or whatever live streaming service are. We'll do it on Oats. And we're just going to watch a 3D modeler build a scene from yes. beginning to end. Like, is yeah, that, that kind of thing. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, if and, and you know, people should be able to tell us uh, that that's what they want as well. You know, like so I, I uh, for that kind of thing. Absolutely. And, and I think a lot of the personalities of the people that we have inside the company would be would love to do that as well. Cool. Yeah. So, um yeah, I mean, I, I would love there to be this this two way relationship where people have the ability to ask that of us and for us to deliver that. I think that's super cool, you know, because it means also that they're interested in the work that we're doing. I'm gonna pitch it right now: the Blomcast <laughs> weekly podcast. Huh. That's all updates, right? And I will <laughs> like how the process goes, uh, how, like yeah. step by step. We've got a name. We're gonna figure out the rest later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, I would right. say I would say just in terms of like building a community because community is huge for feeling like you're comfortable. Like in a create, I can say for myself at least when you're in a creative job and you like to make things and your whole mm -hmm. job exists because there's an audience of people, enough people that want to watch you make it. Yeah. Um, not everyone thinks to ask those questions like that. What you and Adam were just discussing. Um, coming forward and saying to your audience, to that community, which starts small and then grows, what do you want to see? And really trying to uh, respond to that, I think is hugely valuable. Mm. Well, sometimes I think though that your mm. audience might not realize that they wanted something until you give it to them too. So or they, until you ask. They yeah, may not yeah. realize that they wanted yeah. the Blomcast until <laughs> yeah. like they're <laughs> knee deep in into episode 35 and they're like, I'm right. learning so much and, ne and Neil's telling us so mm -hmm. much on a weekly yeah. basis about this production that I feel personally invested in this. Like, cause I think, I think it's not just about investing your dollars. I'm sure you probably feel this way too, but it's, it's feeling invested on a personal level that like mm. that fire, like the connection that you have with the movie in the sense yeah. of it being so personal, how much even more personal that is when, when you know that you were an integral part to that actually happening. When Neil described what he thought the, the explosion would look like at the climax of this this you know film 
he described it so vividly and now two years later it might actually come to fruition i want to make sure that it's as big as it was described it becomes yeah, like, like a weird meme with more money your own for the community and audience right yeah. how, how does your um community ask things of you what's what's the main channel of of communication subreddit twitter, twitter. um yeah and we are from our end this is just sort of like internet 101 um our whole thing has always just been be yourself and be transparent um, mm -hmm. we, the only stuff we, I think we ever try to hide from the audience is maybe we have a surprise, like, uh, a, a project right. that we're working on because we know they're going to like it, but people typically ask us, Hey, what's going on with this? It might have two upvotes, but one of us will jump in and just say, Hey, how you doing? Uh, this is what's going on. Thanks. Bye. Yeah. It's a, it's yeah. a much smaller, like microcosm, but if somebody is tweeting at me or multiple people tweet at me and say, there's this game that I, I really like, I think you guys should check it out. I'm like, okay, well, that's that's what you want. So I'm definitely going to like try to push this through. So I guess it, if it's the kind of thing where you're getting this big outcry, people are saying to you, I, I really want to know like more of the backstory of the fishermen, like yeah. from from Firebase, Firebase. Yeah. Like, is that yeah. something that you would entertain? That you'd be like, maybe I should script yes. that to. No, no, for sure. I mean, that's that's part of what makes you know it. It, it's a different way to look at where filmmaking is going, and um, that part of it is very is very appealing and very interesting, you know. And if it, the way that I look at it is like I'll have ideas that I want to do, and and then I guess the audience has ideas on what they'd like to see more of. And there's this kind of Venn diagram of like where those two things overlap, where both of us are interested, and it's like that that's a really good place to be and then you can kind of look at firebase 3 that way or you know so yeah absolutely um from our experience as not even being a very big thing on youtube like comparatively and everything it is interesting when when it's starting to grow everyone speaks with the same voice like the community that finds you they found you because they love it and they're all mm -hmm. speaking with the same voice as it grows and transcends beyond that now you're s starting to see other opinions, conflicting opinions. And then at a yeah. certain point it grows and it feels like your Professor Xavier in Cerebro mm -hmm. when it's just like he hears literally every voice on the planet, yeah. but you really have to like using your <laughs> creative instincts and like what you've learned along the way, pony, there's Storm, you know, like, right. like, like yeah. you well, kind of have to do it that way. Well, every, every six months, one of us will say something dumb or out of context or not Fully are not fully articulate <laughs> yeah. what we, our brain was trying to say right. in yeah. a moment, and then we'll have to spend the next week explaining what we tried to say, mm -hmm. undoing it. Yeah, mm -hmm. not not really yeah. not undoing, just sort of more more clarity. Yeah, and that's I I hope you're ready for that um, because I I don't know if you have to answer to so many people typically in a studio system because I've never worked in it, um, but it sounds like you're trying to do this really interesting merger between what we know as a Hollywood system and an internet system, but create something that looks like a kind of beautiful marriage of the two, which I think is cool. You know, uh, one way to look at it is is just a place that ideas can be experimented with. And, and, and the only um, downside that you're really going to suffer is the audience telling you that they don't like it at all. Um, yeah. And you need you need or we need to figure out how to do that at a, at a dollar per minute ratio that is, um, you know, constant or right. or manageable mm -hmm. yeah. um and and so what that means is that you could potentially end up with a bunch of very interesting weird ideas that are out there that just would there's no other way that they could be out there yeah is your your goal i'm assuming is to continue to make original content is it kind of scary when most of the films out there that are successful are part of a bigger franchise or a sequel or an adaptation? Uh, no, it's not. I mean, it's not It's not daunting or frightening at all because it's just such a different kind of model. The, the success of those films is often is often um, based on, on, you know, strict box office revenue. And I, I, we're just behaving a little bit differently to that. I think, um, I think that s success for us would be measured by how we inside of oats feel about a piece that we made like if we really feel like we got it right and then mixed with if the audience is telling us that they really like it um if they're straight up don't like it you know then it's it's a little bit different but you have to i think that you have to fail a bunch of times you know you have to just experiment and see where things land if you if you don't risk um i mean this this whole endeavor is like incredibly i suppose it's risky to some degree but uh it's 
it, it's not the easy way. It's not the easy way forward. You know, it's it's a huge experiment, and it comes with a lot of a, an insane amount of difficulty. But it, it, if you get it right, if we can figure out how to make it self sufficient or stand up on its feet, mm-hmm. and be able to put out interesting stuff all the time, it's you know that will feel like a really cool accomplishment. Thirteen hours ago, you retweeted a full game playthrough of the Seventh Guest on PC. Yeah. What is what's the story behind that? <laughs> I love I love like puzzle adventure games, point and click uh, adventure games. <laughs> yeah, I've been I've been thinking a lot about um, about games and just things that I was really into as kind of as a young teenager in, in South Africa, and um, just racking my brain for all of the things that I really kind of that, that surprised me. Like the thing I think that took me down that road was Mist. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I remember the seventh guest, which is which is older, and I was like, "Damn, I wonder what that looks like." So I looked it up, and even like the opening music and everything was just really sort of nostalgic. Maybe maybe it's because of Ready Player One. I don't know. I was I was sort of in in a nostalgic kind of zone. Have mm-hmm. you seen it? I have seen it. Yeah. 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 What would you think? <laughs> <laughs> I I, li- I like it, man. Yeah, I yeah. love I love all the nostalgic stuff in there. I think it's super cool, and I'm a massive Spielberg fan. So, yeah. Yeah. I just really liked it. That's cool. Uh, how did you feel about the eleventh hour, the sequel to the seventh guest? <laughs> um, uh, I didn't play I, I don't it either. Know, I don't. Yeah. I, I, I'm not versed in it well enough to. No, I, uh, I, to, I only know about it because years later I saw it in a box at like a Comp USA or <laughs> right, something like that. Right. Yeah, I remember, seventh guest was that. It was Hilarious. the reason why you bought a CD-ROM. That was right, like, yeah. I think it was the first game with like FMVs. Yeah. I played it like a dork. I guess you don't really <laughs> play it. You sort of you observe. Yeah, <laughs> go experience. through it. Yeah. But I mean, it was so undefined at that point, though, right? Like, yeah. I mean, every I mean, especially with the seventh guest, like that that era, it was just everyone was figuring out what the hell was going on. Yeah, even you Mist know? was a weird sort yeah. of thing where I I always had to call my mom in to help me with the piano puzzle because I didn't know how to play piano at the time. <laughs> right, and right. she would actually help me with the right keys, but it's like yeah. So weird. Anyway, so you're gonna make a seventh guest movie. That's great. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Might as well just dive in with that one. Just blow all the money, all the Kickstarter money. It's known IP, right? So yeah, 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 yeah. that's really good. Uh, Well, cool. I want to thank you for uh, taking time out of your busy schedule to talk with us today. Uh, For more information about Oats and the Kickstarter that you're doing right now, where can people go to uh, find that out? Uh, Well, we have a we have a URL that is for the funding page that um, I'm not sure exactly where you guys will put it. In our description, for sure. Yeah, we'll we'll have it ready to go. We'll put it in the description. uh, That's the main thing. Just go there. I mean, in in essence, this is this is like if if there's anyone watching this who likes the idea of Oats or likes Firebase specifically, give us cash to make another Firebase. That's really what it is. Uh, yeah. Just be ready for a lot of people to say, cool, where's District 10, which is such an original name. Um, but I, I think I it's... Think we should, I think we should call it District 10 if it gets made. Call it 11. <laughs> call it 11 yeah, so that there's a it. promise of going doing a prequel. There's, there's okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm starting, to, I'm starting to, to seriously think about that, uh, that, that particular film. I think. Okay. Because there's, yeah, there's the other 50%, which is also, you know, still back in Hollywood. So mm-hmm. see what happens. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's one last question I did want to go out on just because it's, it's the age old thing. When you first uh, broke out into this game, uh, you were, it was the Peter Jackson is producing this movie with this unknown director. Is mm-hmm. that a relationship you'd ever uh, work on? Like, would you ever want to work with someone like Peter Jackson again and like work on something? You're Spielberg, yeah. I guess. You're Ready yeah. Player One. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, um, do you mean Pete specifically, or do you just mean do you, do you just mean having other filmmakers produce your stuff? I guess, I guess, yeah, Peter Jackson. I, I think because a lot of people want to see. I, I think people have it in their. They have a nostalgic. I, I know I do a nostalgic thing in their brain of like, oh man, post Lord of the Rings, Peter Jackson and District Nine and Blomkamp, get them back together and make a thing that was you know that I really yeah. enjoyed at the time. Right. Um, do you think that's? Yeah, something? I mean, yeah. the answer the answer to that is yes, absolutely. You know, and and I also we we lived in New Zealand for almost two years because there was also the Halo component, and then yeah. there was District Nine. So that that kind of Weta wingnut New Zealand um, time of my life, and and also the the sort of creative. There's a very unique feeling and and and. Um, destination that he's created in in the way that Miramar, which is a, a suburb of Wellington, kind of operates. Um, like I sort of miss that in a way. And I think I think it, yeah, I would I would really relish at the opportunity to kind of go back a little bit into that and and, mm. and do something like District 10. 
uh, but who knows when, you know. Mm-hmm. So, sure. They got yeah. plenty of time. So uh, yeah. well, uh, I will. Awesome. Congrats uh, on the on the studio and uh, best, we wish you best of luck with the Kickstarter. And we we uh, as always want to see you keep making uh, new original stuff. Yeah. You know, that's uh, mm-hmm. I think that's the biggest takeaway, at least for me, yeah. is yeah. that you're you're trying something that a lot of other studios are kind of unwilling to try. So and nobody yeah. has the balls <laughs> to try. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, well, thanks. Massive thanks to you guys. Always. Absolutely, Absolutely, yeah. Let's get some message out. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. You're welcome okay. back anytime. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, man. Take All right. care. Cool. Bye. Okay, bye. bye. And call. Oh, he hung up first. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, then. <laughs> what a cool guy. I would say, though, it's hard to separate those. Things. I agree. There's significance agree. to the film. The, and to whether this film not, specifically. Whether or yeah. not it's intended as entertainment mm-hmm. or not, there's significance to the, its existence and its success. Of course. So I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that stuff's going to go away. I'm just saying now that it's died down right. a little bit, that I think people have a moment to breathe because this also feels like a thing.